record. I will post these to my YouTube channel. So welcome to Organic Chemistry uh, 2341, Organic Chemistry 1. Okay, so we're gonna meet Monday and Wednesday uh, from 11 to 12.20. I'm gonna try to make sure we start on time and end on time. Um, so let's see, uh, there we go. Somebody has resent that. Okay, so uh, first thing we should note is, yes, we're gonna be here for approximately two weeks. And then we should be going back into live class, if at all possible. That's going to be in Geo 1, which is in Centennial Hall. It's on the bottom floor. It's a big uh, uh, room, so we should be able to spread out quite a bit. And I will be recording my lectures and uploading them for those who are possibly exposed to COVID or have COVID-like symptoms, but it's going to lag a couple days. So it's better that you come on time to class if you can. But if you can't, go ahead and we'll have some uh, online uh, videos available for you for that, okay? So I wanted to make sure that we talked about that a little bit to, ahead of time. So um, let's go ahead and get started with my slides. I'm gonna go ahead and share my first set of slides. Sharing here, okay. So, um, all right, great. Hi, Dylan. I can see you now. All right. So, okay. Um, we have now we're going to start with our new spring semester here. My name is Dr. David Irvin. I have a PhD in organic chemistry. I will be very excited about teaching you this. You will see my enthusiasm as we go through. I have to hold it back a little bit sometimes and slow down. So be careful and just say, hey, hey, can you slow down and say that again, please? I get really excited about this. And so I sometimes you know, need that little reminder. So just wanted to get you uh, up on that. Uh, my email address is here, di11. Uh, Email is better than phone. Uh, for some reason, ITAC cannot get my phone set up, so I do not have phone messages on there. So it's best to do email, and I will respond to you within reason, usually within uh, the same day, unless it's a weekend, and then it kind of lags a little bit. Uh, when I do have office hours, I have a Monday, Wednesday from uh, 1 to 2 p.m., not a.m. Sorry, I didn't mix that up. And Tuesday, Thursday, 11 to 12 a.m. So I've mixed those back up. Those are correct on the Canvas site. So, uh, and outside of those, I can set up Zoom office hours, or if you email me ahead of time, I can have a Zoom office hour during that time as well. So uh, those are in-person or Zoom, and I can, I've done both. I've, I did both last semester and it worked out really well, especially for those who don't travel to campus every day. Uh, so that those are really uh, good times, both for coming here with a group of people and maybe doing a little group study with it or coming just by yourself on your Zoom to go ahead and learn, you know, learn individually like that. Okay, so again, uh, use my, um, my email. Uh, as much as possible, avoid the phone. I have office hours that can be live or in uh, or by Zoom. Okay. So uh, just a little bit about the syllabus. The syllabus is on Canvas. In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and share my Canvas screen real quick so you can see some cool stuff about Canvas. Uh, Chrome right here. So if you go to the Canvas site right here, you're going to see number one announcements right here. And up in announcements, we're going to have things like your SI leader will be announcing things, we'll announce stuff like that. The next tab is our assignments. And so all of our homework assignments and grades and exams will all be here. Notice that there's a, a, a thing for all up here, course grade, that gives you your tallied course grade up in front of there. So you can kind of keep track of that your exams and due dates there, your uh, final exam will be there as well as, and all the quizzes. Uh, the quizzes should be offered in person. There are no announcements right now, so that's why you can't see the announcements. Uh, and then there's gonna be homework participation, and I'll tell a little bit more about that. In addition to that, on our front page of our Canvas here, you actually see um, with right here, this is our lecture and exam schedule. So it is my tentative schedule of which uh, uh, 
chapters we're going to be working on. And notice the first two weeks are online. And then we have different chapters and then when the quizzes are going to be. The quizzes typically are over the chapter we have covered the previous week. For example, quiz one is chapter one, quiz two is chapter two, quiz three is chapter three, quiz four is chapter four. And then exam one is going to be over chapters one through four. All right. And so then that will continue all the way through until we have our final. This class has our final on May 9th at 8 a.m. Uh, the later class has it on May 9th on 2 p.m. So uh, we'll be going through that same schedule uh, for all of those. In addition to that, on our homepage here, we have a thing called syllabus, which will be what I'll be going over next. Then we have a tab called resources. Resources include things like slides and stuff. Notice there's a thing called full version slides, and there's a thing called student version slides. Student version slides I release before class so that you can go along, use them, and take notes as you go along. The full slides are released after class, so you can go back and double check your slides to make sure you got everything right. Okay, so that's how I want to do it. I want to do, there's lots of blanks on these and we're going to be able to write names and all these stuff on our student version slides. And then the full version slides will be posted after class so that you can double check your notes, okay? And then there'll also be uh, a place for homework keys. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, quiz keys will be. And then in addition to that, we have on our front page, uh, we have full videos, and that's where the Canvas videos, I mean, these videos, the Zoom videos will be done. In addition to that, I will be doing working out homework sets as part of videos so that you can start your homework, uh, stop and start, stop and start, and just, you know, take the different clues that I'm giving as I'm working through those things and help build that skill to get you to practice your homework. Okay, so those will be in the full videos, which goes to my YouTube channel. And there's lots of other videos there, but all the new ones are the ones that are be most appropriate for this class. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing that now and I'm going to go back to the syllabus slides. Share. Let's see, where do those slides go? Hey, we're up to 97. That's pretty good for a first day of class. All right. So again, welcome back to organic chemistry. We're going to look at our uh, syllabus here. Uh, the text we're using is the 12th edition of Solomon's. The 12th edition of Solomon's is uh, actually pretty decent. In fact, our homework sets are going to come out of there, which is why the study guide and solutions manual is recommended. Okay. It's not required, but it's recommended. The other thing that is highly recommended is an ACS official student study guide. This will do both first semester and second semester. The reason it's so important is we use the ACS final for our first semester and our second semester, and that book will work for both semesters. So it's really good. They run out of it. The stockroom runs out of these. Uh, so you should buy it now or in mid semester as you're preparing for the final because you will run out. Okay, any questions on this so far? All right, so I'm watching my chat here. Nobody's mentioned anything. Nobody's flailing around or strobe lighting their video. So we're good there. All right, <clears throat> next thing is some important dates. Number one is today, class. And so we have 97% participants out of 100. That's pretty good. So we have that, and then on census day, that means you have to come to class at least once before you are marked as uh, participating. So that's very important if you haven't, uh, if you have student loans or something like that. So you wanna make sure you get <clears throat> into at least one of these classes. And that's a great thing about having the participants list on here. I can see that you came to class, okay? Uh, last day to drop with an automatic W is March 29th. And that's after we've had uh, a, a an exam or two, so that's really going to give you an idea. The last day to withdraw from Texas State is the 21st. Hopefully, we don't have to do that, but please talk to, uh, contact me before either one to see if there's something we can do. And if there's not, let's go ahead and keep um, these dates in mind. Uh, the other thing is spring break. It'll be on the 14th through the 18th, and of course, we won't need class those weeks. And luckily, we only have Monday, Wednesday class, so I expect everybody to be back here Monday after spring break, uh, hopefully not hungover. 
so that we can get back into our thing. Then the last day of actual class is gonna be our exam on May 2nd. And then after that on May 9th, we'll have our exam, our final exam, which is the ACS final exam for the first term of organic chemistry. And don't worry, it is heavily curved. Okay, so um, for this, uh, we're looking at our Solomons. We're only gonna capture, uh, uh, cover chapters one through 11 and uh, 12 through 21 are gonna be covered next semester. So this will be following on for next semester. So this is a good thing to do. Uh, attendance is not mandatory, but highly encouraged. And I will be taking attendance through the Bobcat Trace. So I will know if you have been coming to class, if you're struggling, if you're getting really close to that grade, what can we do to get you to the grade you're hoping to get, okay? Obviously, uh, academic integrity is very important. And when we're doing stuff online, for example, our first quiz will be online and that'll be covered by uh, Proctorio. And so those are very important things. I'm sure all of you know very well the academic uh, integrity standard we have here, and please follow that as well. Uh, if you are registered with ODS, make sure you put me in your system and I can get uh, the extra time or other things you might need for these things. I've already received several ODS re uh, requests, so I keep those on a spreadsheet and make sure we have that available to us. Okay, so let's see, move on to the next one here. Okay, we're going to have almost weekly quizzes. Okay, so we're going to have about 11 of them over the next, uh, I'm going to try to squeeze a bonus quiz in for 12. Uh, these are going to be in the first 15 minutes of each lecture time. Uh, they'll be usually covering only one chapter and there'll be a, uh, a multiple choice section and a written section. So you'll be able to draw structures. Okay. If you cannot attend them, they, there will be an opportunity to take them online. There's no written portion online, but it's a little bit harder because you have extra questions. So you kind of want to come to the written quiz if at all physically, if, if physically possible. <clears throat> In addition to that, we're going to have weekly homework. I'm going to provide you homework sets each and every week in, in covering the different chapters. And those assignments will be posted on Canvas. Okay. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to complete these homework sets and upload them to Canvas for a homework participation grade. They're not going to be graded, but the fact that you did them and I can see that you tried them shows me that you are putting in your weekly, you know, work toward this and you're really trying hard to make your grade as good as possible in this class. So that kind of really works together. In addition to that, I will be actually giving answer sets to these homeworks right after the homeworks do, so that you can work through it again. If you only got a couple of them right, you can see how I attack the problems and help you to figure out how to do them for the quiz or the next exam. So that'll be really uh, another way to do that. All right, any questions on the quizzes or the homework? Okay. So uh, what you'll see is by next week, next Monday is when I'll start posting the homework sets. And so then you can start doing it at that time. We're barely gonna cover a little bit of chapter one today. So it's more appropriate that you start it on next week. So uh, then we'll have three exams and those will be given in class. Uh, and so when we have those in class, hey, we have a hundred participants, that's great. Uh, they'll be given in class. Each class, each of them is going to be worth about 15% of your grade. Uh, it'll be a predominantly multiple choice question. It'll be approximately 30 questions with multiple choice questions and then drawing questions. So that they'll be uh, just give the give a multiple choice answer, and then there'll be a drawing portion where you get partial credit. So those are always good to fill out that that. Uh, that written portion because there's always partial credit available to you. Now, the final exam is a little different. It's 70 questions, all multiple choice. And therefore, you also are going to be taking that comprehensive. It covers all the chapters. And it will be a, um, there is no short answer section on it. And that will cover about 20% of your grade because I want the homework participation grade to take over part of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Hmm. Yeah. 
All right, and then another portion of our grade is our SI participation. I, since you've taken, uh, hopefully you've taken um, Gen Chem here at Texas State when we, we have our student instructors as part of that system. If you're new to Texas State, what we have is a student instructor meek weekly meeting that helps with different little topics. They have different little ways of teaching or uh, giving you extra time or extra kind of effort at looking at these different things. To get full participation on there, you must attend uh, 10 SI sessions in our first 11 weeks of the semester. This is occasionally pushed back, especially if we have the um, uh, 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 stops and starts due to COVID. So there might be a 12 weeks we do that for, but just try to go to your SI sessions when they're planned. And it will be prorated for the number of sessions you did. So if you did attend five sessions, you get half credit. If you attend you know, seven sessions, you get 70% of the credit. So it's very important to attend as many of these as possible. SI sessions really, really help. Okay. So what that means is we have an SI participation grade for 5% of your grade. So if you don't go at all, you're starting back at a 95 already. So that's, that's not, not a great way to start. You get your top nine quizzes and there's at least 11. So we're gonna drop at least two, maybe three, cause I usually give a take home uh, quiz just to boost grades a little bit. Three exams at 15% each, homework participation grade. Again, you're uploading it, it's not graded. It's just showing me you're trying. And then the final exam is gonna be 20% of your grade. All right, are there any questions about the grade determination? nothing in the chat and we have 100 people so that's great <clears throat> okay so um chemistry organic chemistry in particular is not something you can just cram for at the last second unfortunately some people try and most of them fail so the idea here is to keep up keep up with the weekly homework keep up with the weekly quizzes if you don't study for a quiz and you happen to do bad, make sure you go back and study that before the next quiz because uh, most of organic chemistry is cumulative. So it's important that if you do tank a quiz, go back and learn it. Look at the answer key and try to figure out how it is. Look at the problem sets online that I'm gonna be posting on my YouTube channel which shows you how to attack the problem and what to do. Um, how many weeks of class till we need to have our textbook or will we need it immediately? Uh, you'll need it starting next week because the homework sets are partially in the book as well as other ones I have. Um, but the sooner you get to it, the better you have to read some of the background stuff. I'm covering the high points here, but the book covers additional little things and maybe has a longer description of something. So the book is actually pretty good to do it. Uh, I know you can rent them online. Uh, I'm sorry, you can get a digital copy online for less money, but then those usually deliver fairly quickly. So as soon as possible is the best, okay? All right, let's see. Uh, when you are struggling with a topic, please come to office hours or send me an email. We'll set up a Zoom session. Uh, I've had a, a couple people that just, you know, just really didn't understand one concept. And one, once we sat down and, and talked about it for 30 minutes, they understood it and really their grades really took off from that. So come and see me early in the semester if you don't some, understand something. Coming to me on May 2nd before our third exam and saying, well, you know, I have a D and I want an A, what can I do? It's like, well, um, you should have come to me the second week of class so we, we could help you figure out what things you do and do not understand. I really want you to understand the basics and then using the problem sets, understand how to attack problems with the information you know. And so that's my goal is that you should be able to figure these things out and or know some of these things that we are going to be using for this semester and next semester. So it's really important to have that foundation. Okay, uh, lectures will be given with many different structures and equations. That's why I actually have my notes that I post ahead of time that we can fill out. And then I post the full notes at the end so that you can double check them. Um, I know it's study three hours a week per class, which is really closer to six to nine hours per week. Obviously you're not gonna do that, but if you do, those tend to be the people who make eight. Uh, the other thing to do is now we have a group me here. On the group me, if you know some people that you have a study group with, that's great. 
get in your study group. Study groups are a great way to do organic chemistry. Uh, and as well as the SI session is almost like a little study group as well. Uh, study group should be, you know, five to six people. Everybody comes prepared, teaches one concept or one set of problems and you work them all together. So go ahead and try to uh, go ahead and get a study group if you work better that way. Some people work better alone, some people work better in study groups, but work however you do. Work the recommended problems at home. Okay, I have a question here. Uh, I know this, uh, the labs do not start this week. The labs start, uh, I believe, after next week. So they are, the, live the live labs are gonna be starting after, the week after next, when we can go back to live class, there may be an online component starting next week. So double check, you should go to your Canvas page for the lab and find out there should be an, an announcement on that. But I believe they are not live next week, they are live the following week. So make sure you go about that. All right, going back to uh, this class, uh, read ahead if at all possible, because even if you don't understand it, you've been exposed to it once, then I talk about it and then you're exposed to it again. Then you do the homework, you're exposed to it again. Now you've seen it three times and very little you know, effort on your part to do that. And you should start to get it. And if you don't get it, office hours. So that's the way to go for it. Uh, use the study guide if you need it and get extra practice problems. Use the ACS study guide specifically looking at what material they're covering. And that's what we're gonna have on our final. All, and like I said before, with the attending class, don't get behind. It's not something you can cram. These are seemingly difficult concepts, but once you understand the concept, it makes sense, okay? There's no mystery, there's no black box. There's just a way of thinking about it. And what I'm trying, I'm going to try to do is show you the way to think about this. It's not hard, it's just a different way of thinking. So I don't want you to get behind because you can't cram a different way of thinking in all at once. And also, don't just memorize. Some I've actually seen somebody memorize and actually pass, but that didn't really work out well for most students. It's better to figure out how it works. If you figured out how it works, you'll be able to apply it to a whole bunch of different things. Memorizing, you might not be able to apply it as well. All right, questions on my helpful hints. All right, so let's move on. Uh, so right now I wanna introduce our SI for this uh, semester. It is, uh, he is Dylan Hartman and I have his slides ready. If you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself, Dylan. Yeah, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and take it away. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and tell you guys a little bit about me. Uh, then I'll go ahead and tell you about SI and why you guys should come. So, a little bit about me, I took organic chemistry uh, last spring. Um, so it was during our COVID semester when we were fully online. Um, I will say that I think um, you guys have a little bit of an advantage when we get back in person. I think um, taking advantage of just getting to know your classmates. Um, I think when I was uh, fully online in organic chemistry, um, I think getting to know my classmates was a little harder, but um, I think that was like the big difference for my success and like getting getting to go to SI sessions and getting to know your classmates that way. But I think getting in person um, will make it a lot easier. So I'm excited for you guys to get back in person. Um, but um, with that said, I am a senior right now. This is my last semester. Um, so I am done after this. I'm graduating, um, graduating with the Bachelor of Science, uh, major in psychology. I have a minor in biology. I was a minor in chemistry as well, um, but I just recently dropped that. So I could graduate, um, go ahead and get out of here. Um, but I am a part of the SCAD lab on campus here at Texas State. Um, we do research um, in the new ACES building. So if you guys are ever wondering around there, I'm in there five days a week, I'm in there a lot. So stop by, say hi. Um, I enjoy basketball. I watch regular season, not just the playoffs. I play basketball, um, big fan, um, have no grandchildren. Only 22, it's just a little joke in there. Um, office hours, so this is a little confusing. I should have fixed this, but um, the only ones that you guys can really attend are my Wednesdays from 10 to 10.50. Um, those will be all through Zoom. Um, so after next week, I'll kind of start sending out the links for you guys to attend those. Um, but you guys can attend my Wednesdays from 10 to 10.50 um, through Zoom. Um, I put my Mondays on there so you guys can um, email me. I'll be in my office. 
um, I'll be on my computer. You guys can still reach out to me. Um, so my email is right there. Um, they can go to the next slide now. Um, so now I'll start telling you guys a little bit about what SI is. Um, so it stands for supplemental instruction. So it is exactly that. It's gonna be supplemental to what you guys are gonna be learning in lecture. Um, so how I kind of like to think about this is um, your SI sessions are gonna be kind of like your gym, right? So um, during lecture, you're gonna be learning how to do your workouts or how the equipment works. Um, and then SI, uh, we might be going over real quick, like how to do the workout, but really we're gonna be doing the workout, right? We're gonna be actually um, doing the reps and doing application to what you guys were learning in lecture. Um, that's really what we try to do in SI. Um, so we're gonna be doing that through activities, um, group work, games, a um, whole bunch of different stuff, um, hopefully some fun in there. Um, if you come to my sessions, I think, I'm not actually sure who our other um, Oakton One SI is, but I know it's me and one other person this, um, this semester, but come to my sessions, I normally give out candy. I have a bunch of activities um, generated around candy, um, but they are only 50 minutes. Um, you guys will normally come in, uh, sign in within the first 10 minutes with your ID. Um, and then normally within the last five minutes, um, you guys will just sign out, leave, um, and then every week you guys will uh, come out. Um, you have to have 10 by April 10th. So April 10th, you guys can put that in your calendar. Um, that is when your, your, all your sessions will be due. So you have to have 10 uh, before that date. Dr. Urban mentioned that that date might be pushed back or moved forward uh, depending on how the semester goes. It's very, very possible. Um, I think last semester it was moved a little bit, um, but um, if you guys have any questions, um, please put them in the chat or anything. I'll be, I'll, I'll look out for it. Um, so I'll also be um, talking with Dr. Irving throughout the semester to make sure that what we're doing in session um, corresponds with what we're going over in lecture, right? So I don't wanna be wasting y'all's time in session. I wanna make sure that when you guys come, right, we're getting the most out of session um, and it's gonna be preparing you guys for your homework, uh, your quizzes and your exams, right? Um, um, but don't be stressed out, guys. They're going to be really fun, uh, informal. I normally have some music uh, on when you guys are coming in, right? Um, okay, so why, sh why should you guys attend? Um, so after every semester, that's Lack Lab, they do, they do statistics, right? They, we get data. Um, and we've seen that for those who do attend, um, they normally get, um, on average, a whole letter grade or a half a letter grade higher to um, those who do not attend, right? Um, so we've seen that in the past, about 10 to 14 sessions seems to be the, the money spot for, for students um, to get the most out of um, for their grade, for the benefit, right? So organic chemistry in the, the chemistry department, we kind of have this idea that they're mandatory, um, but obviously it's, it's not mandatory. It's just a part of your grade, grade but we, we encourage you guys to come. Um, we've seen in the past that students who come really, really, really do benefit, and um, I really benefited. I, I remember my uh, my SI, Gabby, she was amazing. Um, she was the only reason why I know I got an A. Uh, I went to all of her sessions. I know I went to more than 15, um, but I also went to the SLAC lab um, outside of uh, session hours, right? So the SLAC lab, if none of our session times work or if you want extra practice, you can always go to the lab um, at different times and there's gonna be someone there to help you. Um, okay, uh, so last thing here, guys, is these surveys. Um, so I should have already sent you an email. It should be in your email right now. Um, there'll be a survey that will be go live tonight at 7 p.m. and it'll stay open until 8 a.m. on Friday. Um, and this survey is just gonna be a list of all the possible sessions that you're gonna be able to attend um, on a weekly basis. Um, so it should have all of the available ones, not just mine, but all the SIs. Um, so 7 p.m. tonight, guys, please fill out this survey. Um, and pick a session that you're gonna be able to attend every week, right? So don't pick one that you're gonna be able to just attend next week, but not attend two weeks from now. Um, so pick one that you're gonna be able to attend every week for the rest of the semester, um, and you can get your maximum points, right? Your 5% of your grade. Um, so if you don't see the email for any reason, um, email me, let me know. Um, but there also should be a assignment uh, in your Canvas, there should be an assignment in Canvas for, for Dr. Irving um, to also complete this link. Um, so there's two spots to complete it. But if you, for some reason, you don't complete this link by, by Friday at 5 p.m. Um, or Friday at 11.59, um, complete it after the time period. Just go ahead and reopen the link, complete it, and um, 
it should still work and we'll we'll get it all set out okay so um, does anybody have any questions with this just it's really important that you guys complete the survey okay if you guys didn't get the survey link or can't find the assignment please let me know or uh, let dr irving know and we'll get you guys um situated any questions guys throw a lot of information at you and if you'll notice, if you go to Canvas, it is listed as an assignment uh, due this week. So you can click on that uh, assignment and it does have the, uh, the, the survey link in it. So, all right, thank you, Dylan. And so uh, that is SI. And so that's the, uh, everything about the class and the syllabus. Does anybody have any questions about any of that information before we start moving on to chapter one? Nobody's jumping at the chat there. So we're gonna go ahead and head over to chapter one. So one thing that I have here, and this is uh, a uh, periodic table of elements. This is the periodic table of elements you're gonna see on every exam and every quiz, except for the final. So this is the one I'm gonna use a lot in class so that you can get familiar with it. There's also two posted on the walls in Geo uh, One. However, having uh, this closer for, you know, if you're not close enough to the, to the ones posted on the wall to see, this one is the one I go to a lot to show you uh, where things are on the periodic table and how to use the periodic table to solve problems. Don't memorize the periodic table, use the periodic table to help you solve problems. All right, so let's go with chapter one here. So organic chemistry, and we're gonna start with the basics of bonding and molecular structure. Now, obviously you sh some of this is gonna be a little review because you should have learned some of this in Gen Chem, but I wanna apply it more to how we do things in organic chemistry because we have a little bit different bonding than they have. And so we wanna really start focusing on the bonding, the nature of the bonds, the structure of the bonds, the shape of the bonds, and how we're gonna draw them in organic chemistry, okay? So the first thing is uh, why organic chemistry? Well. Organic chemistry is everything that deals with the element of carbon. Carbon is actually really cool because it's small. It's on the just the second row of the elements, but it likes to bond four times. Why is that important? Well, because it can bond four times means that you have a huge number of different ways it can bond. It can bond once, twice, three times. It can bond to metals. It can bond to nonmetals. It can bond to all these different little things, and that gives it a very big variety of ways in which it can be used. And because of that, that's where it comes to having it used in all these different biological compounds we have because of the variety we have of it. Now, um, if a compound does not contain carbon and usually the, a hydrogen, we consider that to be an inorganic compound. So organic does not mean it was grown happy on a farm, it means that it has carbon and or hydrogen in it, okay? So most of our molecules, we'll see some that uh, we'll use, that we'll say, we'll use in here like ammonia. It's technically not an organic compound, but it's something we're gonna talk about and use. All right. So to remind ourselves about things, a compound right here uh, is, a, uh, is made up of a combination of elements compound okay and a compound is different from an element because an element is made up of all the same types of atoms okay and they're all the same they have all the same different stuff so a compound is when you have more than one element in a in a material that is bound, has chemical bonds in it but an element is just made up of the same kinds of atoms. And so that means that a R, hang on, do that. So that means that our atoms, which we should be very familiar with from, oh, that's an S, not an E. We have our positively charged nucleus containing protons and neutrons. And then we have a surrounding cloud of negatively charged electrons. Okay, 
So a lot of people say, oh, you know, you have the ring of the electron going around and then you have the nucleus in the middle. Well, really, it's not exactly that way. It's a cloud. It's basically the cloud or this where the electron can be is about where it should be 95% of the time. Okay. So it can be anywhere in that space 95% of the time. So that's what we have to think about those clouds, not a, a fixed ring or a railroad track around the nucleus, but somewhere in a three-dimensional space around that. <coughs> Excuse me. So that means that each element actually has a unique atomic number. And we call that atomic number Z, okay? And Z is defined by the number of protons in the nucleus, okay? So that defines each different type of atom. So if we look at the periodic table here, our hydrogen here is atomic number one, Z number one. And that means it has one proton, okay? So that means we can go down to here to cadmium and it has atomic number 48, which means it has 48 protons, okay? So that means we can define each and every element by how many protons it has, okay? Cool thing is carbon is right here. Carbon has six protons. And so we, it's atomic number six. And so we can identify every Z number just by looking at the periodic table. So you don't have to memorize it, okay? So let's go back to our definition here. Now, if we have the atomic number is the number of protons, and the atomic mass includes the protons and the neutrons and a little bit of electrons. Electrons don't weigh much, but they're, they're counted. Then that means that we can have isotopes. And isotopes are things that have the same number of protons, but can have different number of neutrons. And if they have different numbers of neutrons, that means they have a different mass. And if they have a different mass, that means they're not the exact same element, they're an isotope of that element. And we have to distinguish those because those become very important, especially when we start talk, talking about spectroscopy or reactivity or molecular weight. All of those things change when we have isotopes. So let's look at some common isotopes. So if we look at carbon here, carbon actually has three common isotopes. The first and most common is C12, which has six, oops, six protons right here and six neutrons, okay? So the six protons means it's element number six, Z number six, but then its atomic mass is 12 because it has six neutrons. So six protons plus six neutrons equals a molecular mass of approximately 12. Okay, so we also have a carbon 13, okay? Now carbon 13 is gonna become important when we do NMR spectroscopy, nuclear magnetic spectroscopy, because carbon 13 is active in this. So how do we get to that 13? Well, we still have six protons because it's carbon and the Z number does not change, but we have an extra neutron, which means we have seven neutrons, okay? And if we have seven neutrons, that means we've changed the mass to carbon 13. Okay, so by analogous, by to get to carbon 14, we must still have six protons because it's carbon, but then we have to have eight neutrons to make it C14. C14 is actually interesting because it is radioactive, slowly decays over time down to uh, uh, carbon 12, and we can actually date things because it has a certain very low, very slow half-life, and so we can date organic compounds that have been isolated for a long period of time by looking at how much C14 is there versus how much C14 should have been there when it was made, okay? So that's two of the values of isotopes. We also have isotopes of hydrogen that become important. In hydrogen, we have one proton because it's atomic number one, but we have zero neutrons because it's atomic mass one. If we have, uh, we add one neutron to that, we still have one proton for deuterium, but we have one neutron to give it molecular mass of two deuterium. Deuterium becomes important again because it is heavier than hydrogen, so it changes, and we can we uh, have this particular material is invisible to NMR. We can see this one, but we can't see that one. So we we're going to use that when we talk about NMR. 
And then we also have a radioactive isotope of hydrogen called tritium, where it has one, new, one proton, because it's atomic number one, and two neutrons. Okay, so that's how we have isotopes. We change the number of neutrons in the system, which changes the molecular weight. The number of protons remains the same. Questions on isotopes? Nothing in the chat so far? All right. So I said that those electrons are found in clouds, and these clouds have different shapes, okay? So the first cloud we have is what we call a spherical cloud or an S cloud. The S cloud is, imagine it's like the chocolate shell of an m and Okay, it's this little area outside the nucleus where the electrons are found 95% of the time. So that means that the nucleus is all the mass in the center. And then there's this huge cloud around the outside where the electrons are. And the electrons are negatively charged, meaning that the outside of the atom has this negative charge on it. Okay. So we have all the mass in the middle and we have this electronically charged cloud on the outside. Well, what's in the middle? Uh, what, what's the rest of the space? The, the rest of the space is nothing. That creates the volume of the atom. So the nucleus creates the mass of the atom and the electron creates the volume of the atom. And that's how we have our three-dimensional matter. In our space. Now to give you the idea about how much empty space there is, if you took a golf ball and put it in the middle of Bobcat Stadium on the 50 yard line, the first electron cloud shell would be outside the, the, the stadium, okay? So there's that much empty space in between the nucleus and that first shell, okay? And that first shell is a S shell or shaped like a sphere right here. So when we start adding electron, when we start adding electrons to atoms, let's say we, we can add three or four or five electrons to atoms, they can't all fit in the same orbital. Every orbital right here, this is an orbital, can fit two electrons, okay? So our first orbital is the one closest to the nucleus and we call that the 1s orbital, okay? And in that 1s orbital, we can put two electrons, okay? So let's go back to this periodic table. So if we look at this right here, we have, a two things on our first row of our periodic table here. We have, oh, I'm sorry, uh, we have hydrogen and we have helium, atomic number one and atomic number two. Okay, that means that we can put one electron in atomic number one and make it neutral, and then two electrons in helium and also make it neutral. But notice that we have filled our 1s orbital, meaning everything on this row right here is the 1s orbital, and we can put up to two electrons in that orbital, okay? So now what happens when you have a higher element that has more protons? Well, we can do put in a second electron shell. And so let's say we put in our second electron shell here, we can put two more electrons in that, okay? Because there's two electrons available for that. And then if you have even more protons, you can start to put in a new shell, okay? So we have our 1s shell, which was a sphere. We have our 2s shell, which is a sphere that completely covers the 1s sphere, okay? And now we have three equivalent energy orbitals that stick out from there. And we call them P orbitals. Now we have three equivalent orbitals because they're a different shape. They have this barbell shape right here. And we have three equivalent orbitals because if we have this barbell shaped thing and we wanna spread them out in three dimensions, they have to be one on the X axis, one on the Y axis and one on the Z axis. That's why you have Px, Py, and Pz. They're equal in energy, but they're on three different axes, okay? 
So we have three different energy levels available to us. Okay, so then let's say we have even more protons and we fill up another S and another P. Well, we can then go to our D-shaped orbitals. <clears throat> and our D-shaped orbitals can have a total of five orbitals to fill, which means we can put a total of 10 electrons. In. All right, let's compare this to the periodic table. So we had our 1S here, which was this whole set here. Okay. And now we have our 2S. Our 2S is these two elements here. And then by adding another proton, we have to go to our 2P. Oh, well, that means that all of these right here will have 2P. So in our 1S orbital, we had two electrons. So we have one, two available to us. In our 2P, I mean, on our 2s orbital, we had two electrons available to us, one, two. And in our 2p orbitals, we had three equivalent orbitals. So that's two electrons in each orbital. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so you can use the periodic table to show you which orbitals are where and which, how many electrons are in each of those orbitals. <clears throat> now let's go to the next one, which was the 3P. The 3P is going to be here. I mean, the 3S is here. The 3P is there. And the 3D is this set right here. So that means we can get 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 electrons in that third level. Okay, so most of the time we're going to deal with these first two right here. And so let's look back at that energy diagram. Okay, so in this energy diagram, we have where we're going to spend most of our time is, well, we're going to fill this 1S and then we're not going to really play with it very much. But we're going to play a lot of time with this 2S and this 2P orbital. Okay. So that's where we need to pay attention to and where we can find those on the periodic table, okay? But <clears throat> there's some rules. When we're filling orbitals, we have to fill the lowest energy orbital first. Okay, think about it as, and, uh, as you have a little you know, hole and you start filling it with rocks, okay? Is the rock gonna stop up here at the top or halfway down? No, it's gonna to try to roll down to the bottom and fill the bottom first. And then we're gonna fill as many rocks as we can there. And then we're gonna fill a little more and fill a little more. So electrons do the exact same thing. We're gonna put our first electron here, our second electron here. Then we can put an electron up here. And then we have to fill that orbital before we put any electrons over here. So we're gonna fill from the bottom up, okay? Electrons will then populate that orbital to maximize the total electronic spin. Okay, what do we mean by spin? Well, an electron has charge, right? And it actually spins. And when, elect when something with an electric charge has spin, it creates a magnetic field around it. So really every single electron has a North Pole and a South Pole, okay? Now, let's think about taking two electrons and shoving them together, right? Negative cloud, negative cloud, we're shoving them together. They're repulsing each other because they're negative. How can we get two electrons to stay in the same orbital? Well, we minimize some of that electron-electron repulsion by aligning our magnetic fields so north and south are attracted to each other and the north and south on the other side are attracted. That's minimizing some of that electron-electron repulsion and allows them to line up. So if we had this as our north facing pole and we had this as our south facing pole, that means the electrons we're gonna put in our first orbital here are gonna be lined up where the first one's gonna be north, the second one's gonna be south. Now we have a north and south lined up, that's minimizing some of the electron electron repulsion. And now we can fill the next level. And so we'll put a spin in there. And then we have to pair that up, okay? So this is still uh, rule number two right here. Okay, now we go to the P's. 
Now, in rule number two, we have to maximize total electron spin, which means our first electron is going to go in the first orbital. Our second electron is going to go in that second orbital. And our third electron is going to go in that third orbital. Notice they're all spinning in the same direction. Okay, that's what we mean by maximizing total electronic spin. Okay, now once we've put one electron in each of those orbitals, we can now come back and start pairing those electrons up. So when we have a total of eight electrons in our outer shell, we'll have all of those paired up. Okay, so bottom up. Maximize spin, which is you have an orbital that will have one spin in it. And then to get that orbital filled, you must spin couple. You must pair that with the opposite pole. Then you fill the next level. And then you start filling the next level. But notice we filled them one in each orbital first. And then we spin paired them because they're all of equal energy. Does everybody understand how we fill these orbitals up from the bottom up and including our spin? Okay. So I don't see any questions there. So let's try a few. Okay. So I want to try a few using the periodic table. Okay. So the periodic table that I want to use is going to be this one right here. <clears throat> this one's very similar to the one I showed you. This one actually has the different orbitals shown on it, but I want you to recognize these on the other one. So what we're going to do here is notice that our 1s is here and here. So technically, we could actually put our helium here, and it would fill that s orbital, okay? That 1s orbital. And then next we go to our 2s. We're going to fill that next. And then if our element has more protons, we're going to start to fill these. One and two and three. And then on these, we'll have to start pairing them up. OK, so let's try a few of those right here. So let's try. The first one I want to try is boron. OK, so let's look at boron right here. So let's look at our periodic table. And if we look at our periodic table, let me take away some of this stuff here. We got to find boron. Boron is element number five. So it's going to be this one right here. OK, so we had to fill the other ones first. So we have one electron here and then a paired electron to fill that 1s. And then we have one electron here. And then we have one electron here to fill that 2s. <clears throat> that means we have one electron here. OK, so we have one, two, three, four, five electrons because boron is number five. And we're going to do a neutral molecule it has to have five electrons in it. So let's look at how we would do that. OK, so we're going to fill number one first. And so we're going to have one up and one down. We have to spin a couple of those. We have a total of five electrons, right, because this is element number five. And we're going to put two more electrons in here to fill that S. OK, which means we can put one electron in here, and now we have five electrons. We're done. We have neutral boron, and it has five electrons in it. We filled, filled from the bottom up, and we spin paired to complete different shells. OK, so let's try another one. Let's try carbon. No, no. Let's try nitrogen. It's harder. OK, so let's go back to our table here. So we're going to do the same one, two. And then we're going to fill. We're going to do the same one, two for the S1. We're going to do the same one, two for the S2. But now we have to go one, two, three electrons because nitrogen is number seven. So let's go to do that. So we're going to do the nitrogen. We're filling it here. We're going to do the one S. We're going to do the two S. So that's a total of four electrons. We have element number seven. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. OK. So why didn't I pair any of those up? Because of rule number two. Rule number two says we have to fill one electron in each of the orbitals first, each of the equivalent energy orbitals first, before we start pairing them up. OK. 
So do we see how that works? We're filling those orbitals up all in the same spin until we have to add a next electron. So let's add a next electron. Let's do uh, chlorine, no fluorine right here. Fluorine right here, it's element number eight, nine, seven, nine. It's element number nine. So let's go look at that. So we have element number nine is fluorine and I'm gonna use green on this one. So fluorine is number nine. So that means we're gonna fill our 1s right here. We're gonna fill our 2s and then we need one, two, three, four, five electrons in that p orbital. So let's do put five electrons in that p orbital. And again, I'm gonna use green again. Okay. And so we're gonna do our 1s is full, one, two. Our 2s is full, three, four, five, six, seven. Notice I haven't paired anything up yet. Eight, nine. Now I had to pair them up. Those last two orbital, those last two electrons had to be paired up. So now we've done neutral fluorine. Hmm, that's interesting. We have an almost filled orbital. If we remember from freshman chem, we want full orbitals, half filled orbitals, or empty orbitals. Those are the happy orbitals. Huh. How can we fill this orbital? Well, we can just put an electron in, right? But what happens to fluorine now? Right? We started with neutral fluorine. It only had nine electrons. So if we want to do fluorine minus one, that means we have one more electron than protons. So that means by putting an extra electron in here, we're going to get to fluorine minus one. Now, Fluorine minus one. Huh, in Gen Chem, that was one of those really common ones. It really liked being fluorine minus one. Well, now we know why. It filled the orbital. It filled that 2p orbital to do that. Okay. So now let's do carbon. Right here, we're going to do carbon, and that's element number six. If we go back to here, we have our, our 1s right here. We have our 2s right here, and then we start with our 2ps. We have one, two electrons in our 2ps. So let's go look at that with carbon. And so we have one and two, those are filled, those are filled, and we have one, two electrons. All right, so that would be neutral carbon. Now notice if we wanted to fill this orbital, it'd have to be carbon, uh, minus one, two, three, four, minus four. If we wanted to empty this, we'd have to have mark carbon plus two. So it's probably not going to do either one of those. It's we're going to have to do something else with this configuration. Questions on filling these electrons from their shells up. So we are going to start doing this empirically, and we don't have to do it with a chart like this. We can do it with our table uh, periodic table of elements okay now when we look at this remember this 2s completely covers the 1s okay which means these orbitals these electrons in that two energy level are on the outside of the atom and these two electrons are completely covered by the outside electrons so we call these core electrons because they're in the core. And we call these valence electrons because they're outside, they can bond, okay? So our core electrons are ones that are inside completely covered by our valence electrons. The most important shell is our outside shell. Our outside shell are those valence shells or valence electrons. Those are the ones that do all of the bonding, whether it's ionic bonding or covalent bonding or whatever kind of bonding, those electrons, those valence electrons are the ones that do the work, okay? So it's very important to know the number of valence electrons you have because that tells you how that atom's gonna bond. So do you need to memorize this? No we can look at our periodic table and assign those. But 
in general, carbon has four valence electrons because it's in group 4A, okay? Nitrogen has five valence electrons because it's in 5A. That's not VA, that's 5A, okay? And halogens have seven valence electrons to play with, okay? So let's look at that on the periodic table, okay? So if we look at the periodic table here, we have the ability to start looking at, okay, this is one valence electron if we had hydrogen. We fill that orbital. And now we start with these, we can fill this with valence electrons. This would be one, two, three, four. So for carbon, we would have four valence electrons because it's the element right here. You don't even have to know what the element is. You just need to count over and say, oh, this one's gonna have seven valence electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons. So just by using the periodic table. So let's look at that again with the periodic table. Okay, you can find everything you need on the periodic table here for valence electrons. For example, let's find the number of valence electrons for oxygen. Oxygen here, okay? So the 1s right here and here is completely covered by the 2s. So, Oh, we have a row missing here. There we go, okay. This row, this is our 2S and this is our 2P, right? So that means we have one, two, three, four, five, six valence electrons in oxygen, okay? So you can find everything you need from the periodic table you do not have to memorize. So let's look at this right here. So carbon has four valence electrons, Nitrogen has five valence electrons and oxygen has six valence electrons, all from the periodic table. So don't memorize it, know where to find it on the periodic table. All right, questions on that. Uh, for fluorine, does it matter if the first two electrons or the last two electrons are in the p orbital up here? Okay. In the case of the 2p orbitals, those all three orbitals are of equal energy, which means you can put them in any, any orbital you want. So as long as they're spin coupled and you have the correct number of electrons in there, it doesn't matter, okay? Does that answer your question, Kaylee? Sorry if I- Yes, it does, thank you. Okay. Sorry, if I forgot to look over there. Okay, all right, so let's, Okay, so we know that the valence electrons are important. We know how to find them on the periodic table, okay? So why are they important? Well, because they contribute to our bonding. Only the valence electrons contribute to bonding, okay? So we only have to worry about those electrons. And there's two main types of bonding we use here in organic chemistry, and those are ionic bonding, which are very familiar because that's what we do most of the time in organic I mean, in, in organic chemistry. And then we do covalent bond. In ionic bonding, we actually transfer one or more electrons from one atom to another to create the ions. And remember, why are we doing that? Remember when we did fluorine here, when we wanted to make it the minus one, we wanted to fill that orbital. So we gave it one extra electron to fill that orbital and it became an ion. Now this fluorine minus one is gonna form ionic bonds because it has a negative charge, okay? So that's how we do ionic. So if we, one electron was given to that atom to make it a negative charge. And that means we had to take an electron away from a different atom and it probably has a positive charge. So that's ionic bond. We give electrons back and forth between elements, usually to fill or empty a atomic shell. Now, Covalent bonding is different. That's where atoms share electrons, not necessarily equally, but they share electrons, meaning that neither atom has a full positive or negative charge, but this, the electrons are shared between them and they spend part of their time at one atom and part of their time at the other. Okay, so we have a rule for this, okay? We call it the octet rule, which means most elements, except for the exceptions you see below. Most elements, you wanna have a total of eight valence electrons around them. <clears throat> okay, mm, 
why eight? Well, most of the time we're talking about the number two energy level. And the number two energy level has an S and three equal P's. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. To fill the 2s and the 2p, you need eight electrons. Therefore, we have the octet rule, eight electrons. Okay. <clears throat> that being said, that means carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine all want to have eight electrons in their outer shell to bond, either by uh, ionic bonds or by covalent. The differences are hydrogen typically only has one or two or none, lithium, beryllium, boron, sulfur, and phosphorus. Now, beryllium usually only has two because it fills the 2s orbital. Boron typically has three because of its electronegativity, and we'll talk about that. And S and P can actually have up to 10 electrons because it can actually throw some electrons into that three, that three energy level. So that allows them to get bigger and have more. But for carbon, oxygen, uh, nitrogen, and fluorine, always look for eight electrons total, okay? That's what we call the octet rule, okay? So when we're long talking about this, we have to think about the uh, ways of which to name the electron configuration of the different systems. Okay, so when we talk about that, we talk about like hydrogen, we have only a 1s orbital, okay? And it, so that s orbital can fit two electrons, okay? Which means its outer shell, the maximum number of electrons it can ever have is two, okay? because it's filling that S orbital, okay. But neon, which is next to fluorine right here, has the 1S and those are core electrons because those are completely covered by the 2S. But then we have the 2S and the 2P and we have two electrons for the S, six electrons for the P, which means neon, one of the noble gases has eight electrons in its outer shell. And if we go down one more, argon, the S's are completely, the 1S is completely covered by the 2S. The 2S and 2P are completely covered by the 3S. That makes all of these core electrons and only these valence electrons. And we have one, two plus six makes eight valence electrons. Okay, so what's, what does this mean? The octet rule means that we're trying to completely fill that outer valence shell, okay? So in the case of hydrogen, that's two. In the case of most of the other elements, it's going to be eight, okay? So that's why we wanna target two electrons for hydrogen and eight electrons for the other elements. Questions on the octet rule. Okay, does the octet rule apply for the fourth energy level? No, uh, the fourth energy level um, if you have uh, some Fs and other, the higher uh, orbitals, then you have more electrons. Uh, so this works predominantly with the first and second energy levels. Like I said, with the phosphorus and uh, the sulfur, they can actually go into the third energy level and there's more electrons there. There's eight electrons in the second energy level. There are 18 electrons in the third energy level and then there are uh, 18 plus 32 in the fourth energy level. Okay, does that answer your question, Isaac? All right. <clears throat> so predominantly we'll be dealing with the second energy level and the target here is eight electrons. So <clears throat> that means using the periodic table, we can figure out exactly how to do this. So we have carbon, which is uh, number six. So it's one, two, five, six right here. So that means we're gonna have a one S with two electrons in it. We're gonna have a two S with two electrons in it. And then we're gonna have a two P with one, two electron. All right, it's not labeled here. So let's go over here and look at carbon. 
right here. Carbon is right here at element number six. So we're gonna fill up our 1s here and here. We're gonna fill up our 2s here and here. And then that's gonna leave us one in the P and a second one in the P. So we have two in the P orbital system, which means we have, oops, not that. We have our 1s with two electrons in it, our 2s with two electrons in it, and our 2p with two electrons in it. <coughs> that means we have a total of four electrons it needed to complete its octet. And guess what? Carbon bonds four times. So let's look at nitrogen with a plus one charge. Okay, so where's nitrogen? Nitrogen's right here at number seven. Okay, so let's do neutral nitrogen first. Neutral nitrogen would be 1s with two electrons, 2s with two electrons, 2p with three electrons, because it is in that third row, it's higher than carbon, so it's going to have three electrons. But we said it has a plus one charge. How do we get a plus one charge? We, we, have electron. A, we remove an electron. We want to have a mismatch, mismatch between the number of protons and the number of electrons. So we remove an electron. So we, instead of being three, it's going to be two. So that means carbon in its neutral state has the same electronic configuration as nitrogen in its plus one state. Interesting, right? So that's let's question. Do, um, yes. That, can I like change the, what do you call it? Like the stability of that actual element though? Like, is that now carbon? No. Remember, the Z number, the number of protons controls which atom it is. The number of electrons just controls the charge. So for example, carbon here has an equal number of electrons to protons. So that means its net charge is zero. But okay. nitrogen here has one less electron than it should have to be neutral. Therefore, it's going to have one less negative charge, which means it's going to have a plus one charge. One more proton than electrons gives it a plus one charge. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, good. So now let's do a hard one. Sulfur. That's going to be down here somewhere in this third energy level. So let's look at where sulfur is on our third energy level right here, which means it's going to have, this is going to be a 3P. And it's going to have one, two, three, four electrons in its 3p to be neutral. So let's go ahead and figure that out. So we're going to have a 1s, 1s with two electrons, a 2s with two electrons, a 2p with six electrons, and then a 3s with two electrons, and a 3p with four electrons, right? So we filled up our S1, we filled up our S2 and our P2, we filled up our S3, and we had four electrons in our P3. So that would be neutral sulfur. But we want negative two sulfur. Hmm. So we need to have two more electrons to give it a misbalance of protons to electrons. So that means we're going to not have four electrons here. We're going to have six electrons. Okay. One electron gives it a minus one charge. Two electrons gives it a minus two charge. Okay. Now look what we've done here. We have six electrons in a P orbital. We filled that orbital. Look at this right here. When we looked at our orbitals, we wanted to have a total of six electrons to fill it. We filled our p orbital to give it a full orbital. That's why sulfur minus two is such a stable ion, because we have a filled orbital. So let's do oxygen minus two. It's a little bit easier because it's one up. But notice oxygen is right above sulfur, which means it has one, two, three, four electrons in the p orbital as neutral. So let's do that for oxygen here. I'm going to do it in a different way. 
color, 1s2, 2s2, 2p4 in neutral oxygen because it was fourth over. It was this one right here. So to get it to minus two, we have to add two electrons, which gives it my, a P of six, which fills the two orbit. That's another reason why oxygen is so stable as a minus two element. Okay, do we understand electron configuration and how we can control a plus or minus charge on those elements? Okay, because this is important because we're gonna want to use this in helping define whether or not we have an ionic compound, whether we have a covalent compound, and whether or not we have the right number of electrons in our system. So this is important. All right, so let's move on. So in the case of ionic bonds, we typically give electrons or receive electrons to empty a shell or fill a shell. And that's gonna give us our most stable ions, okay? Now, ions that are positive are attracted to negative ions, which gives us an ionic bond. That's the attractive force between those two different forces, okay? So that's how ionic bonds work. And it's a very strong interaction because this is fully negative, this is fully positive, And so they're pulled together right here, okay? But what is the defining factor of whether something bonds ionically or it bonds covalently? And it has everything to do with electronegativity of the individual atom, okay? So electronegativity is basically an atom's ability to attract the shared electrons in a covalent bond or have the electrons stolen away to make an ionic bond, okay? So basically it's how much do you want electrons? So, you know, you can imagine, you know, that you have some elements uh, want to have electrons more than other elements do. And that's the idea of electronegativity. So how do we know whether it's an ionic bond or a covalent? Well, we look at the difference between electronegativity of the elements. And the difference of electronegativity tells us whether we have a covalent bond or an ionic bond. But it also tells us whether we have a nonpolar covalent bond, a nonpolar Polar covalent bonds are not as reactive as polar covalent bonds. Okay, so what's the difference? Okay, so if we have an electronegativity difference between two elements of two or more, then that means that it is going to form an ionic bond. Okay, so the most electronegative element is fluorine. It has an electronegativity of four. There's no units. Cesium here is the least one at 0.7. The difference between that is 3.3. So that's above two, which means fluorine and cesium form only ionic bonds, okay? It's greater than two, so that only forms an ionic bond. Fluorine is 4.0. Carbon is 2.5, giving us a difference of 1.5, okay? So that means the carbon fluorine bond is actually in between 0.5 and two, meaning it gives us a covalent polar bond. So it's a covalent bond, they share electrons, but it's polar, meaning it can do work. There's something reactive about it. Now, carbon is at 2.5, hydrogen is at 2.2. So that means a bond between carbon and hydrogen is a nonpolar covalent bond. So it's nonpolar covalent. So we have ionic bonds are greater difference than two. Polar covalent bonds is 0.5 to two. And less than 0.5 is a nonpolar covalent bond. So how do we know what's what? Well, turns out we can use the periodic table. Okay. The periodic table of elements says that electron negativity increases as we go toward fluorine and increases as we go up to fluorine, <clears throat> okay? And so with hydrogen being kind of like in the middle. Right? So that means that as we go across a row, electronegativity will always increase. As we go up a column, 
electron activity will always increase, okay? So that means if we look at our periodic table again, we have this little stair-steppy thing right here. And that little stair-steppy thing right here separates our metals right here from our non-metals, okay? It also kind of is of the boundary where most of the things over here are gonna create covalent bonds. And typically polar or nonpolar covalent bonds depending on how close they are. Almost everything over here is going to create some kind of ionic bond with that. That's not 100% true, but it gives you an idea of how we can look at that, okay? But we'll have to look at the difference in electronegativity between the elements to figure that out for sure. But the general trend is everything going up and over increases in electronegativity. Okay, so how do ionic bonds work? Well, in the case of sodium chloride, if we have sodium and we started filling up its orbitals and we look at it where it is on the periodic table, the neutral sodium should have one electron in its three S orbital, okay? So we had one electron in our 3s orbital right here. Now, that's a half-filled orbital. It wants to either have an empty orbital or a full orbital, okay? But its electronegativity is less than that of chlorine because chlorine's on this side of the periodic table, or this side for you guys, and the sodium's on this side. So they have a big difference in electronegativity. Chlorine is more electronegative, therefore it wants an electron. So let's look at chlorine. Chlorine is gonna completely fill our one and two S's <coughs> and then have almost a full three energy level done, but it needs one more electron to fill that shell. So if this S, three S electron is given to this three P orbital, we now have a full orbital for chlorine as a minus one, a full orbital for sodium as a plus one, both the orbitals are full. Both elements are happy. Both elements have charge and they have opposite charge. So that difference in opposite charge makes them ionically bonded. And the driving force is to fill those orbitals and knowing where the electron goes depends on the electronegativity of the elements, okay? And that is uh, where I'm going to stop today. Sorry, I ran about three minutes over, but we will continue here on Monday with this slide, and we will, uh, I will also assign the homework problem set on Monday as well. Okay, uh, bye, thank you, and I'm going to stop recording. If you want to stay behind and ask questions, please do. If not, go ahead, and I'll see you on Monday. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.